Hi folks, welcome to episode two of series two. Thanks for joining us today. If you missed episode one last week with Mary, you can watch it back on our Facebook page or our YouTube channel and uh, it would be well worth doing that. We got off to a good start last week. This week, we have got our youngest ever guest. Welcome, Katie. Hello. How are you doing today? I'm good, thanks, yeah. Nervous about yeah, this? Once- uh, kind of. I'll be glad when it's over. But <laughs> <laughs> it's not that bad. You've seen all the other ones, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. So you know what the you know what the deal is. I think so. Yeah. Any of the previous ones that you particularly enjoyed, or um, they were all good for different reasons. Couldn't point one out. That's a very di- diplomatic answer. Um, and I should just congratulate you as well because you're a student, so you've done very well to get out of bed for half past nine to record this this morning. So well done on that. Thank you. <laughs> now, um, just for the benefit of folks who are watching who are not from Perth, you live in a little village just outside of Perth called Medvin. Yep. Um, is that that's where you've you've always lived? Yep. Same house, same village all my life. Wow. Um, so maybe for the benefit of people who've never been to Medvin which is probably quite a lot of people. Maybe you could just describe it to us. What's Medvin like? Um, a small village <laughs> with virtually nothing to do, uh, with a Chinese and Indian in it and two shops. You say nothing to do. If you, as long as you've got a Chinese and an Indian, what more do you need? <laughs> ah, exactly, I suppose. So what, what would be the top uh, tourist attraction in Medvin? Um, probably Medvin Den, where there's a big stone that has... Uh, the date of the Battle of Methven on it, and Methven <laughs> Castle. So the biggest tourist attraction is a big stone with a date uh, on it? Well, Methven Castle. I'll give you oh, Methven Castle, yeah. So there you go. Anybody who's looking for a place to go on their holidays, once all the restrictions are lifted, Methven is uh, probably not the place to, to visit. Um, so you've lived there your entire life. We're going to go back and just pick up one or two things from your childhood. As a child, you had a pretty serious accident, is that right? Yeah, so when I was six, um, over the summer holidays, I fractured my skull. Um, I fell off my bike at the park and just going down a hill at uh, average speed and just fell off my bike. My mum originally thought that I'd scrape my just hurt my wrist and my nose um, and it wasn't until 24 hours later that we realised it was more serious um, and everything started rolling out and they like nobody thought that anything had happened because there was no symptoms of concussion um, but eventually when I got to Nine Wells I was uh, I collapsed and was paralysed and everything went off. Wow so that that was quite uh quite serious stuff then. Were you in hospital yeah. for a while with, with, with that? Uh, so I was only in hospital for a week. Um, but then I had to go back to get my staples taken out, I think. Or, I don't know. And has that had a, a, that accident had a lasting impact on you? Or was it just, is it something you've thought much about over the over the years? Um, it's not had an impact um, as far as like day-to-day life goes. I mean, I suppose it's just, wakened me up from a young age um, to how close like death is, to how close, how fragile life is, I suppose. Like, you know, one day you can be fine and the next day you can be so close to The other thing from your, your childhood that, that had a, a very uh, big impact upon you was uh, you, your dad uh, passed away when you were, was it 10 years old? Yeah, I was 10. Yeah, so yeah. I, I don't know how much you want to speak about that, but I guess you 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 got good memories of of your dad and as a child. Yeah, I used to actually spend a lot of time with my dad when I was younger. Um, I used to play with him quite a bit. Uh, go to his work because he worked on his own in an office. Uh, so over the summer, I used to spend a few days a week, uh, going to work with him. So his whole illness and death was very sudden. Um. It was just after Christmas, it was the day after he'd taken family home to Brecon um, and he took a stroke in his work but we didn't know. So I got sent down to my friend's house and my mum went down and they originally thought he was just 
dizzy on collapsed or something. Um, he didn't realise it was such a major stroke because he'd just fallen asleep with it. Uh, so he was then in hospital for like 11 months and well in hospital from December to August and then in a nursing home from August to November um, and he just he got a chest infection and he just couldn't find it. You've been trying to do a lot of things to to raise awareness and to, to raise funds um, for some of the people that helped your dad. Um, do you want to tell us a wee bit about that as well? So 10 years on from this event, I um, decided that it would be a good idea to just give back to the people who helped us and also if anybody went through, if anybody goes through the same as us, that they'd get the help that they need. Um, so I decided at, in February this year that I'd ra raise, try to raise so much money um, by December and hand over the beginning of next year. What sort of stuff have you done so far to, to try and raise the money? Um, I've done a few quizzes around Mevlin. I've done uh, 10,000 steps every day in a month. Um, and I've cycled from John O'Groats to Land's End virtually <laughs> over lockdown. <laughs> That's great. And I'm sure your dad would be really proud of, of what you're doing. And you, you also, did you set up a, a Facebook page recently as well to sort of raise awareness a wee bit? Yeah, so I set up a Facebook page um, to raise awareness and so that people can share their stories and just to get some chat going and to for people to know that you know strokes don't just happen to older people; they can actually happen to anybody. Yeah, and on on that, I noticed um, it would be maybe a few weeks ago your mum had a little um, video on there about her experience or her yeah. perspective of it, which I thought was really. Uh, really interesting, really touching as well. So I don't know if when this video goes up on Facebook, you can put a link to that underneath if you want, and maybe some folks would would be interested to check that out. Did that sort of bring you closer to your your mum over the years, maybe? Yeah. So I mean, I was close to both of my parents when I was younger. Um, I was closer to my dad. Um, but yeah, me and my mum have become best buddies. <laughs> And uh, now we've become much closer over the uh, past ten years. A few years back, your your mum was unwell too, wasn't she? Yeah, so she had um, breast cancer for the second time. Um, thankfully, it wasn't as serious as the first time, um, and she just got it removed and just kind of came back clear, which was I was very thankful for. Because um, back on back, it was, there was only about five years between the two of them. Uh, so it would have been hard going to lose both of them. Yeah, and I guess I guess that, that thought must have gone through your mind at that time. It, was, it must have been quite a difficult thing to, to cope with. Yeah, I think once you've lost one parent, the whole thing becomes so much more real. Um, mm. And, you, yeah. But then by the age, at the age of 14, 15, you don't think that you're going to be thinking about losing two parents in the space of five years. But thankfully, she's still here. <laughs> yeah, very thankful for that. And um, it's been great to get to know your mum a wee bit. She's been along to the, the Gospel Hall a few times. And um, so hello to Anne if you're, you're watching. I'm pretty sure your mum will be watching this, won't she? I uh, hope so. <laughs> yeah, she'll be watching to make sure you don't say anything that you shouldn't say. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure she'll watch it at some point. Um, that's great. So, you, obviously, we've gone through a few things in your childhood there that have, that have been pretty difficult, um, really tough experiences for anybody to go through, but especially at that age. And I guess, you know, since you've become a Christian, that must have helped you a lot to just deal with the, the things that have happened in the past. Yeah, knowing that there's always somebody there. Um, knowing that God's always going to be there by my side and that I can speak to him about anything. Um, and just also having reassurance as a Christian, there's no what's going to happen after life. Well, we're, we're going to go and speak now a wee bit about how you became a Christian and so on. So just to, <clears throat> to go back a wee bit, um, as a kid, your mum took you along to the, the church in Medvin, um, Church of Scotland there. And was that mainly to the Sunday school or was that to the other services as well? Um, so I was christened as a baby 
when I was like three months old. <laughs> um, and then what's, when what's I was, your memories of that? Oh, nothing. I get told that I steamed the church down though. <laughs> it's apparently freezing cold and I cried the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, um, so when I was two and a half, I started going to Sunday school at Mevin Church. But obviously, if Sunday school wasn't on and there was another kind of service on, uh, as I got older, my mum would take me along. But it was mainly Sunday school there. What's, what's your memories of the Sunday school? Because I met one or two of the, the older ladies that I think maybe used to be your Sunday school teacher and they seem like really uh, lovely uh, people. Did you learn a lot of, sort of Bible stories as a kid and things like that? Um, so they were actually, yeah, the Sunday school teachers were really nice. Um, I learned a few stories mm -hmm. like uh, Jonah and the Big Fish <laughs> um, and Joseph's story um, and obviously the like Christ's birth, death and resurrection. Um, but these were just all stories, um, same with creation as well. Um, none of them actually meant much to me. When did you first come into contact with Perth Gospel Hall then? Um, so I think it was 2013, but I can't actually remember fully. Um, I became, so this wee boy moved, Ross, moved into uh, new houses down the road from me um, and I'd go down and just cycle around and just, I don't know what I was doing to be honest. <laughs> um, and I made friends with him and he used to come up every Sunday afternoon after his Sunday school and we used to discuss what we'd learned at Sunday school. Um, so this was the time that my dad was in hospital, I think. We became friends. And my other friend, Caitlin, had moved out of the village. So I was kind of left with him. <laughs> um, and after a year of getting to know him, he invited me to Super Club. Uh, and I went. And then continued going to Sunday school from there, I think. So the, just for, for anyone that doesn't know what Super Club is, maybe you could attempt to describe Super Club, if that's possible. Um, it's a super club that involves a lot of noise, a lot of kids, and probably a few sugar rushes at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of sweeties as well. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if you remember, you know, how you first felt um, when you came along to the super club, what you made of, made of all. Um, so I don't remember super club as much, but I remember Sunday school, and I remember thinking, how do these kids know so much about the Bible? Like, I seem to know the basics of about five stories, and they seem to know in depth about all these different people in the Bible. Um, I remember uh, finding it quite amazing that like five-year-olds knew more than me being 13. I, I sometimes still find that, that five-year-olds know more than me, so that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's well, maybe not maybe difficult. It's not as unique. <laughs> and can you remember much about what you, what you, were, think, what you were thinking about the message that you were hearing. So, was it, you know, when you were beginning to hear the gospel, did it kind of make sense straight away, or did it take a wee bit of time for it to sink in, or what was your sort of understanding at that that time? Um, so I seemed to know the story, but I didn't quite realise how much it should mean to me. I think, um, and I think with losing my dad, I thought, well, wait a minute, I need to know where I'm going when I die. Um, especially after realising how close death can be uh, from fracturing my skull because I remember waking up, not waking up, but not being able to sleep and going downstairs and crying thinking I'd die in my sleep. Um, and I think just that kind of opened my eyes and made me think this gospel message actually should mean a lot more to me than just a story. Yeah. So that, that's kind of developed over a little while and then there was a series of, of gospel meetings that we had, which is a kind of special series for, I don't know if it was two weeks or three weeks or something that we had them. And that, that was in 2015, I think, yeah. from memory. And what's your, what's your memories of, of that then? Um, I don't remember much of the meetings, actually. <laughs> um, I remember you and Alistair Bagel speaking um, and obviously they meant something to me. I remember going every night quite faithfully 
um, and not missing a night. But I don't remember too much about the meetings themselves. And that was a time when you, you became, a, became a Christian? Yeah. So how, how, how did that sort of come about? Um, so I think there was discussion at home about it all. I seem to remember going home one night saying to my mum, I need to be saved. Like, I'm not a Christian. And she said, you are. And I said, but I don't feel as if I've come to the point where I've been saved. Um, and I don't quite understand why I didn't do it there and then. Um, but I remember learning in Bible class before about the acrostic crab. Um, <laughs> confess, repent and believe. Um, so a shout out to, to Daniel Field, who's the creator of Crab. <laughs> um, and I think I just kind of knew that I had to go through this. And so, and also with hearing the message as well, I knew that I needed to do it, like more so, and the urgency of it. Um, so I just, one night after the meeting, decided, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to pray and he saved, I know I need to do it, it needs to happen now. Um, so I did it. How did you feel after that? Was there any kind of particular feeling or emotion about it or was it just sort of done? Um, so I actually doubted myself a bit with it. Um, I think because I knew things, I knew about Christ, I knew about God, I knew about the cross and his resurrection before. Um, it wasn't as maybe life changing as other people's stories have been. Um, but I knew I'd done it um, and it wasn't until a few months later I was out for a walk with one of my friends and she started asking me questions about salvation and baptism and she said oh so are you saved um, and I said I thought about it and I thought why am I doubting this like I've I believe in that Christ died for me and I've repented of my sins and confessed them. I'm safe. And it kind of just all kind of hit home and I was like, why am I doubting myself? And then from then on, I kind of just knew that I was saved. That's great. And I think that'll probably be helpful maybe to some folks who are watching as, as well, who've maybe had similar yeah. experiences or feelings and maybe even at the moment uh, having similar sort of feelings or doubts. Because, yeah. yeah, the key thing is if we if we do what God asks us to do, which is simply to repent and, and believe, then we've no reason to, to doubt it. We just take God at his word. Um, so no, that's that's great. So that was that was a wee bit kind of after you'd got saved that you kind of got that assurance and yeah, clarity. Yeah, it was really a made. month or two after I was saved that um, the clarity came. Excellent. And... When did you then get baptised? That was a wee bit later, wasn't it? Yeah, so it was a few months on. Um, it was September of that year, so I was saved in April. Um, and, yeah, I was baptised end of September. Obviously, the Church of Scotland don't believe in full immersion baptism. They believe that christening. Um, so, I suppose I had to discuss with my mum. Um, and I kind of brought her around and just shoulder that actually this is what I want to do and I wanted to do it for the right reason I didn't want to just do it for the sake of doing it um, and she came around to it quite quickly Excellent and then can you remember much about the, the day you got baptised? Um, yeah I this is famous in the hall I seem to be the one that everyone points to to say to remember their clothes I remember forgetting half my clothes after coming out of the water and my mum had to go to Tesco's to get me clothes. Yeah, that's one of the vital things. Anybody watching, if you're getting baptised anytime soon, take a change of clothes because the ones you're wearing are going to get wet. That's... Yeah. <laughs> I didn't pick that up, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> you hadn't noticed that from the baptisms that you'd yeah. seen, that they were a wee bit wet when they came out of the water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to remember what the, the, the night, but I can't really remember much about it myself. But oh, Well, you baptised me, so... <laughs> I was trying to remember if I had baptised you or not but, uh, you and Dan. It was you and Daniel Field baptised me Well, all this goes to prove is that I'm getting old and extremely forgetful So, <laughs> <laughs> um, Obviously there's other important elements about, about the Christian life And like you said before, you, know, you, you became a Christian fairly young You had had that kind of uh, 
sort of church background and, and, and so on, and I kind of knew a bit about the Bible. So there maybe wasn't, uh, like you said, there maybe wasn't a dramatic transformation in your life, but I guess the, there was some there was some sort of change maybe in your your outlook on life. I really enjoy reading my Bible, um, and I found it quite important. Uh, same with praying, obviously my mum being ill quite soon after being saved. I kind of realised the importance of prayer and how much it needs to be shown in our Christian life and how much it does actually help and work. I was going to ask you about your Bible reading. Do you have a set kind of plan that you follow through or how do you go about it? Um, I don't really go by a plan. I uh, tend not to be able to read a Bible in a year. Um, same, same here. So. <laughs> I tend to just take my time, um, a chapter a day usually and try and take it in fully. Um, I find if I read too many stories, I don't understand them or get really confused and don't quite re- don't know where I've left off or where to pick up. Yeah, I, I'm exactly the same. I can only think about, you know, a little, little bit at a time and try and take it in. So, no, that's, that's great. And Christian friends and friendship, I guess that's been important to you in recent years to spend time with other Christians. Yeah, so obviously in Mevden Church, I was kind of floating in the middle. There was people 10 years younger than me and people 30, 40 years older than me. Um, and nobody really my age. So I suppose coming to the hall and being saved and baptised in fellowship and having all these people the same age as me has really helped me and um, brought me on in Christian life. Um, and I suppose in some ways, like I probably wouldn't have grown much if it wasn't for these Christian friends. Um, and it just shows that Christian friends are so important and if you don't have them it's so easy to just kind of fall away. I was just going to touch on one or two other things that have happened since you became a Christian so one of them was in 2017 I think it was you went out to Tanzania. Yeah. Um, that was, a, was that a school trip? Yes yeah, so it was with uh, Perth Grammar School and Vinestrass. Right, so it had some kind of Christian element to it, is that right? Yeah, so we actually stayed in a Christian school, in a Bible college in Tanzania. Um, and we also attended a church, no, well, two churches in Tanzania. What were you actually doing out there, other than uh, getting a suntan? <laughs> no, I didn't get much of a suntan. I was told when I came back that I was paler than somebody stayed in Scotland. <laughs> um, I was building houses for two families who didn't have a house. For has, has anyone checked up and to see whether those houses are still standing? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't just me building them, so... <laughs> You've not thought about becoming a builder then? No, I'll leave that to somebody else. <laughs> what's, your, what's your kind of main memories of Tanzania then and the people that you met? Oh, they were just so uh, thankful for anything. You know, you give kids balloons and they'd keep them. They wouldn't blow them up properly for about three weeks. They'd want to keep them just so they can blow them up and let them go. Um, And the people are just so thankful and so genuine. Um, And they just have nothing. Like, they really know what it is like to live with nothing. And I think it does, like, almost strengthen their faith because they genuinely do pray that their next meal will come from somewhere and their next drink will come from somewhere. Whereas people here would just... You just kind of take it for granted that we've got our next meal or our next drink. Um, a couple of other places that you've visited that are not quite as warm as Tanzania. So one being Pitlochry and the other being Shetland. Because um, you've helped at both of those places in Christian yeah. youth camps in recent years. Um, which, which one did you do first? Um, Pitlochry. Pitlochry. So that, that was the Tayside Christian youth camp up at Faskley House and you'd gone to that as a camper for quite a number of years as well. Yeah, so I'd been as a senior camper, um, but I was a helper at juniors, which was slightly different, slightly more all go. (laughs) No time to just watch the campers do their own thing. Um, But it was a really good experience and it was good to be able to speak to younger, well, younger uh, children and possibly Christians, I'm not sure how many of them would be saved, Um, and just really encourage them in their faith. And just seeing like believers' children and grandchildren there as well, 
and being able to really encourage them and just watch them slowly grasp God's word yeah. and the gospel message. In Shetland camp, that was, was that quite different or um, yeah, similar? Yeah, that was very different. Um, they obviously don't have as much on the island as we do in the mainland. Um, but it was very good being able to, nice being able to spend like time on the beach. Um, and time with other campers who might not ever hear God's word again. Because um, obviously all these things go into schools in Shetland and they get the camp for free. Um, so being able to really witness to these uh, six, seven girls that we had in our dorm. Um, and thinking that actually this could be their last year at camp um, if they decide not to come back the following year was very good. So the question that we all want to know. Mm-hmm. Which camp is better? Tayside camp, Shetland camp? I don't know. I couldn't tell you that. <laughs> they're, both, they're both very diverse and to be able to say which one's better, you couldn't do that. Excellent. So you're hoping to go back and, and do more of that in the future? Yeah, if possible. next year. And you've, you've also made some, some new friends and met a lot of new people through doing that as well? Yeah. From all, all across the country? <laughs> yeah. Um, so... At the moment you're at college, you've been at college for the last couple of years. Um, what is it you're studying again? I always forget. So it's changed. Last year I studied health and social care and this year I am studying additional support needs, support an individual. Okay, and you've moved to a different college as well? Yep. Okay, so you're no longer at Perth, you're through in Fife, Fife College. Excellent. And it's all online at the moment, I take it? Yep, sitting in front of this computer screen quite a bit. All day long. Um, so what are you hoping to do when you finish that then? Have you got a, a, an ambition in mind or a, a goal in mind? Yeah, so I want to work with um, adults with additional support needs. Um, I currently have a relief job at Upper Springlands in Perth. Um, but with lockdown, the whole thing's been put on hold and... Obviously, they've closed and I've not been able to get in. So, Last year, we had our Christian Society at the college. I think you are officially the head of the Christian Society, or you were. <laughs> how, did, uh, how did you feel about that responsibility? Well, the pressure was on. <laughs> <laughs> if the room wasn't available, that was it. <laughs> so just, just to explain to people, we, did, uh, we went along to the Freshers' Fair at the college last year and then... I think it was actually it was Katie that had the, the idea of maybe running some talks at lunchtime and you managed to organise the, the room for us to do that and other bits and pieces. So um, you obviously had a desire to to share the gospel with your fellow students, which is great. The other thing I was just going to mention, during the, the lockdown period, for quite a while you were sending out a daily text message, a little thought for the day type thing. Where did the, the idea of that come from? Um, I don't actually know. So it started off with a one day thing and then another message kind of generated itself and it just kept going. Did you keep a note of how many days you actually did that for? Mm, no, although I'd imagine it's near 100 given I did it from about March to August. Yeah, that's a good effort to keep churning out ideas and thoughts uh, every yeah. day for that period of time. But no, that was that was great. It was really encouraging to, to receive them each day. Um, we're going to just wrap things up a little bit with a few more general questions like I normally do. So first one, mm -hmm. do you have a favourite Bible verse? Yes, I think so. Would you like to share it with us? So it's Joshua 1 verse 9. It's probably quite a well-known one, and I'm not sure if anybody else has said it so far. I don't think so. Um, so it's, have I not commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord your God is with thee wherever you go. And is that, is there a particular reason why it's your favourite, or is it just one that's always stood out to you? It's one that's always stood out to me, and it's also on the back of my Shetland Camp hoodie. <laughs> Uh, so I felt I should probably use it as my favourite. Excellent. Um, and what is the best thing about being a Christian? Um, oh, there's so much. 
Um, probably just knowing that God's with you, that he's got a plan for you and he's made a way for you and that he's always there for you. Like, regardless of the day or the time, you can just speak to him and he will speak to you. He will give you an answer. Um, and regardless of how hard your life is or has been, there's a way back to him and there's a way to him in the first place as well. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we finish? Anything we've not said or missed out? No, I think that's it. That's it. Job done. Yep. Excellent. Cool. Well, thanks very much for your time, Katie. Thank you. That. No problem. And uh, thanks to everyone uh, for watching. And hopefully you can join us again next week and we'll have someone else in the hot seat to interview next week. But for now, goodbye and God bless.